Well, welcome everybody. Again, I'm Brian Kohlberg with Zeller Technologies. Thanks for being a part of this, this webinar. We, uh, we're going to answer some age old questions today, why size matters and why that is uh, such a, uh, an issue that keeps coming up in our social worlds and, and today really in our water world. So really excited to have Jeff Bergman from ABB here. Um, he's, he's been in the industry for many years. I'll let Jeff explain a little bit more about his role with ABB and in some of his experience as we get into uh, this presentation, the second one of our five that is uh, thinking of selecting and sizing a VFD for your pump or water applications, what do you need to know? So our goal here is, again, to give you the best information, the best uh, um, intro to what, what drives are doing, how do we do this right, and make sure that we're setting a good baseline of information as these webinars continue to be rolled out we'll get into a little bit deeper dives some other uh, application issues some other things that we can really take a deeper dive into so we appreciate you for being here today obviously zeller is a partner with abb uh, vfts the drives on both the industrial and the water application side of the world uh, alongside of just selling drives or helping folks get drives we do offer services um, whether that's startup services power uh, motors pumps. Um, we are a distributor and uh, authorized partner with ABB on, on many of their lines and, and controls and VFD is being a big part of that. So we appreciate this partnership and, and Jeff, your time being here to, to help our uh, both our team as well as, as many of our, our clients out to better learn what, uh, what ABB is doing. So I'll let you roll from here, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Glad to be part of this. And remember, uh, Zeller is one of our AVPs, our value added providers. And uh, so any kind of questions you got, please uh, always feel free to reach out to, uh, back to them. I'm going to turn my video off here because I'm getting a little bit of a lag on my end. Uh, as Brian uh, stated, once I get figure out how to use my computer here, uh, my name is Jeff Bergman. I'm the business development manager for the water wastewater business in the South region. I currently live in Orlando, Florida, but I've been working in the municipal uh, end of the business, water and wastewater, for uh, in excess of 30 years, working on uh, electrical distribution, switchgear power distribution, uh, variable frequency drives, product management, a lot of different roles there. I'm a longtime uh, member of the Hydraulic Institute, uh, and I uh, still today chair several committees on uh, training, industry coordination, governing regulations, and those kind of things. Uh, and I do uh, a fair amount of speaking engagements uh, uh, to different organizations, groups, and operator trainings, and that to, to help engineers keep their PDHs and to help uh, operators get their hours. Uh, so that's just enough about me because I know you guys didn't come in here to listen to this. You came in here to listen to something about sizing VFDs. So I'm going to start off with something here that is uh, very near and dear to uh, ABB's heart, and I know Zeller feels the same way, health and safety. Um, one of the things about the wastewater business is there's a lot of cont con uh, contagions in the water. Uh, you always want to protect yourself uh, with gloves, wash your hands every time you're in and out of the facility. Uh, in a surface aeration area, I always make the joke, don't smile because you never know what's floating around in the air. Um, uh, ABB has a very strong policy of don't look the other way. If you see something that looks unsafe, please shout it out, let everybody know, but let everybody be aware. We're all better home, better when we can go home that night. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, but all uh, ABB employees are required to uh, have uh, P the proper PPE, and we always encourage you uh, wearing hard hats on the facilities, uh, good steel toed shoes, and the correct uh, equipment for where you're walking around or working. So today we're going to talk uh, about the basics of how do you select and size a VFD. Now it's very easy to pick up the phone and call Jim or one of the guys at Zeller and say, "Hey, I got this is the application I got. Can you guys size this for me and let them come out and work with you?" But we're going to teach you some of the things that you really do help you uh, uh, educate yourself so you can make better decisions and help them a little bit out. We want to talk about what types of enclosures, what types of drives, how do they want to be mounted, what kind of environment we want to work uh, work into, uh, and we also want to make sure that we have successful installations for your VFD application because. The worst thing we can ever have is when we buy a new piece of equipment, we end up with an oops or a gotcha at the end of the project. Um, so we'll uh, very briefly kind of uh, cover uh, what we covered in the first uh, session. What is a drive? A drive is an electronic means to control the speed of an AC induction motor. Um, uh, all VFD motors need to be uh, three phase, but the VFD can take single phase and convert that to three phase. Um, Variable frequency drives carry around a lot of names. They carry around the name inverter, frequency converter, that damn thing on the wall, uh, variable speed drive, uh, lots of things. Today, the term I'm going to use is just going to be drive. Um, there are AC and DC drives. 
Uh, we see DC drives more in positioning and high-end control stuff. Again, you can reach out to Zeller if you have any applications that uh, require DC. Uh, most of what we see in the industrial business or the water wastewater business tends to be more on the AC side. Um, uh, there are different types of voltages. Uh, most voltages are at 200 volts. Uh, be 230, 208, 220, 240, uh, or 480. Uh, we also make a line of uh, variable frequency drives that work at 2300 volts, 4160. Uh, so we pretty much cover the gamut. We make a variety of wall mount products in addition to cabinet built. Um, and again, the, the advantage of the drive is a soft start and soft stop the, the, the motor and the load that it's on. Uh, less mechanical wear and tear, less water hammer through the lines, those kind of things. Uh, by motor, motor monitoring, protecting the motor, and protecting the cables, protecting the equipment that it's connected to. Uh, and there's a lot of water specific uh, parameters in the VFD, the pump clean or anti-ragging capabilities, uh, PID controllers, flow calculations, motor preheat, keep the motor warm. Instead of putting space heaters in the motors, you can buy, uh, you use a standard motor and use the VFD to keep the winding warm. Uh, many, many other things that we'll continue to talk about over the, over the time. So what kind of things, again, do we want, we may see, you may encounter, you may encounter broken pipes, you may encounter uh, partially closed valves. Uh, if, you're, if you're looking for reasons why you would want to use VFDs, these are the kind of things you'd want to be looking at. Um, clog or block pumps because the flow rate is too low through the pump and it builds up strings and debris on the impellers. Expansion joints misaligned because of the starting and stopping of the equipment, maybe loose bases on the motors or the pumps themselves. Uh, applications or installations that have high maintenance requirements. Uh, uh, also uh, areas where we've got a high cost of control system with the upkeep where we've got continually modifying a PLC or a SCADA system to keep in control of the systems. Um, leaky joints or, or bad seals from water hammer, uh, bearing, bearing failures, uh, seal failures and pumps and those kind of things. Of course, the, the big one that I alluded to earlier is water hammer. Uh, the best thing we can do is help you reduce your water hammer. That'll really help uh, on your infrastructure. Um, so some of the reasons we use variable frequency drives, of course, is, is we start looking at the energy savings. That's one of the, the capabilities of the VFD. Uh, and with that, we've got two types of drive for the applications. We've got a uh, constant torque, which is more, it's more of a, of a simple physics application of how the load and the torque are used. Um, constant torque applications would be hoists, conveyor belts, uh, compressors, positive displacement blowers, positive displacement pumps, gear pumps, those kind of things. Um, they're things that don't have, a, don't have a lot of inertia and when you lose power, they stop pretty quickly. Um, and the speed and power are pretty linear. Uh, on a uh, variable torque application, this is more centrifugal pumps, uh, centrifugal fans, uh, scroll cage fans, centrifugal blowers and those kind of things, uh, where the power varies with a cube of the speed. So if I have a 10% or 20% reduction in enter in speed, I can have a 50% reduction in energy. And, that, and that's really the big energy saving play that we make here when we're talking about VFDs. But some of the real reasons we're applying a VFD are not for the energy, it's for the process control. If we can make the process more efficient operation, then uh, that does a better goal overall. Um, here's an example of where we can see the uh, uh, the flow versus uh, speed. Uh, and one thing to understand is as you're decreasing the speed of the pump, you're also decreasing the flow out of the pump. So it it's kind of falls one for one. So if you look here, your speed is 90%, your volume's is gonna be about 90%, your head pressure is gonna fall also. So the pump's not producing as much head or as much pressure in the system, but your power required to do that falls off pretty quick. Uh, as I said, if you go to 80% of speed, 20% reduction in speed, um, your head pressure falls by 64%, but your power is 50%, 40, 51%. So a very significant energy savings. We rarely run pumps uh, or blowers and those kinds of piece of equipment in the variable torque applications much below 50%. Most of them run about 60%. Um, so typically that's why uh, we typically won't show numbers or go much below that. Now, variable frequency drives uh, are, are really give you the capability to adjust the speed to match what's required. That can be flow, pressure level, turbidity, DO, whatever it is you're looking for. Uh, the VFD provides a gentle ramp up or down in the system to reduce the mechanical, electrical, and hydraulic surges caused by starting and stopping a motor. And your biggest expense out here, the one of the biggest uh, pieces of equipment you got here, what is connected to the VFD. So you want to monitor and protect the motor and the cables that are connecting to it. 
um, you'd like to maintain a consistent process. You know, one of the uh, the challenges we have in the municipal end of the business is, is that the load is dynamic. It changes based off of the hour per hour, minute per minute. Um, so if it was a it was a standard consistent process, it'd be very very easy to build the equipment. We've got to have equipment that handles the surges or the large influx of rain events uh, from the high the highs and lows of each day. Um, but what we would like to do is prevent that 3 a.m. call out where the municipality does not have to dispatch a, an electrician or tech or mate, mechanical guy out because they've got a problem out in the system. Now, I've talked about what things can do, but there are some things that VFDs are not designed to do. Uh, a VFD cannot boost the output voltage significantly above the input voltage. Uh, so if you've got a 208 volt system, I cannot run a 460 volt uh, VFD motor on that package. Uh, 208 volts uh, would run a 208 volt uh, motor uh, in a v 208 volt VFD. So you cannot in the field, like a motor, uh, the motor has different taps inside of the, uh, the, the terminal box there. Uh, VFD does not. So the VFD is rated at either at a 200 volt class, which is 208, 220, 230, 240, or a 480 volt class or a 600 volt class. They are all separated, and you do need to make sure uh, that you've ordered the correct one because, uh, they, as I was saying, they really won't work interchangeably. Uh, you cannot run a single phase motor on a VFD because it sees the capacitor as a direct short circuit. You need all three windings inside of the motor. However, as I said earlier, you can use a VFD to do single phase conversion to take single phase voltage in and run that three phase voltage on the output to the, to the pump. Um, the only thing you've got to make sure you're doing there is you have to remember you're bringing all the power that would normally come in on three wires in on two. So you've got to oversize that VFD by about double to offset that uh, in additional inrush current that it's going to see. Uh, just because we can make a motor go faster does not mean we have enough power to make it go faster. So if we have a variable torque load, as that curve rises up, uh, as we increase the speed, we do not always have enough uh, power inside of the motor, enough horsepower uh, to turn it to make it go faster. So uh, if you're ever having an, an application where you've got to overspeed the motor, you really want to work with your manufacturer, pick up the phone and get somebody on the, from, from Zeller, talk directly to the manufacturer uh, to see if it's feasible and how much uh, headroom you're going to have into there. And, and this is one of the things that I echo in every presentation I have. Uh, if we have a VFD, if we add a VFD to a system, it will not solve all your system problems. Sometimes if you have a problem, you had a drive to it, now you've got a problem with the drive on it. So it really is not always the, the fix all in there. It can make a lot of, help a lot of situations, but there are some situations that it really isn't uh, designed for. Always reach out to us uh, here at Zeller uh, or at ABD and give me a call directly. It would be more than happy to uh, help you out. Uh, I've talked a little bit about single phase, and this is uh, more of a standardization uh, a feature of a VFD. The VFD will take the single phase in and uh, output three phase. The advantage you've got is, is you can now standardize on three phase pumps in your system. You get better flow, better efficiencies, uh, better operation, and it's more consistent, but your guys know those pumps. It makes them easier to work on. Uh, so the, the capability of using the single phase in and the three phase out uh, will get rid of a will actually eliminate the need of a rotaphase phase or an atta phase, which is more of a mechanical uh, maintenance nightmare sometimes. Um, we, uh, some manufacturers produce a very specific drive designed for single phase and they're already sized properly. Some of them derate them. Uh, reach out to your manufacturer, reach out to Zeller. Uh, we'll be happy to guide you uh, on that uh, design. Now, altitude and temperature, you know, one of the things that the VFDs uh, really are susceptible to is intense heat. Uh, we want to keep the VFD cool because it's got electronic components inside of it. You guys uh, all know that uh, the hotter something gets, uh, the, the shorter its life will be, or it's got to be designed for higher temperatures. Most VFDs designed today are typically designed for uh, 40 degrees C or 104 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, however, we do see operating ranges in, in our industry uh, up to about 122 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees C. Um, all VFDs have the capability to be derated for those higher temperatures. Uh, and remember that the VFD is not really affected by the humidity in the air or the wind blowing it. It's affected by the raw temperature. So we, your heat index is not is the number we want to look at. We want to look at the actual temperature. And uh, if we can have that VFD in the shade out of the direct sun, uh, it will be cooler and it will actually run more efficiently. Uh, altitude is always an issue, and that's more for density of air getting back to the cooling. We want to make sure we have enough density of air to take that heat out of the VFD. Uh, most VFDs designed today are designed for 3,300 feet. 
Um, and uh, that typically works in most of the United States, most of the areas we see. If you've got areas above that, reach out to your to the manufacturer, reach out to our hardware guide, reach out to someone at Zeller. We'll kind of walk you through the calculations you got to do. Um, if you've got an application where it's at a higher altitude and the temperature is going to be lower, uh, you can use those two features uh, against each other where you may have a, a benefit of running it at, uh, you know, maybe 80 degrees uh, at 6,000 feet. Uh, so you can take that into account. So there may be times that you have no D-rate, but it's just better be safe, uh, better be cautious because uh, when the VFT is running, when you're in a high temperature extreme or high altitude extreme, you always want to make sure that uh, you don't have a gotcha or an oops where it won't work accordingly. Uh, now, uh, as we talked about in our health and safety moment, uh, there are a lot of uh, gases, there are a lot of, uh, of uh, caustic materials uh, in our industry. We have ammonia, we have chlorine, we have hydrosulfide gas, uh, we have uh, sea salt and sea salt spray uh, from the air, uh, hydrogen chloride, hydrogen fluoride, ammonia, uh, a lot of uh, chemicals that can, that can when, they're, when they're aerated, can do damage to printed circuit boards. And, that, and that's really the, the chemical protection we're looking to provide here. It's the corrosion that affects the, these printed circuit boards that eventually will cause the VFDs to fail. Um, uh, almost every VFD built in the world today is manufactured to a European standard. Uh, it says IEC 607-21-3-3. Uh, and there are a couple of different classifications of this. This is actually going through an update uh, at IEC where they're now requiring that we actually do raw testing of the boards at these concentrations. We're no longer allowed to self-certify. We've all got to go through the certification. So you're going to see a, a much more stringent uh, requirement for us as manufacturers to really, when we come out and say we're 3C2 or 3C3, um, what we're able to really handle and, and, and withstand uh, as a VFD is. A lot of VFDs today, we don't even bring outside air in through the electronics. We just run a high volume of air across the heat sink. So we're not bringing that air with those uh, chemicals inside to the enclosure. Uh, we're just keeping them on the outside of the enclosure. So we're really not having as much uh, erosion or corrosion uh, developing on the uh, printed circuit boards. Now, this is rule number one. One thing that I will stress this over and over and over again, because I get this call all the time, someone will call up and say, hey, Jeff, I need a 75 horsepower VFD. And the first thing I ask them is, is what is the application? What kind of a pump have you got? Can you take a picture of the nameplate? And the reason is, is that I really am looking for a little bit more information. What I'd really like to see is the full load amps that that motor needs to run at that, to develop that amount of torque and horsepower that it's rated for. Um, uh, different types of motors have different types of applications, but it's very, very important. Anytime you can get a picture, a snapshot of the full load amps off of the nameplate of the motor and send it to Jim or any of the guys there, Zeller or myself, um, uh, it really helps make sure that we're sizing it correctly because there's some, some issues here. If you've got a 75 horsepower uh, motor and it's a low RPM motor, it's going to draw more current because there's more poles in the motor. Uh, if it's a submersible motor, uh, it's not a NEMA B motor, and it actually draws more current per horsepower, and it's going to be a bigger motor, so bigger VFD. So these are some of the things we really want to catch in the early stages of the concept of the design and layout. Um, full load amps, full load amps, that's a, uh, the saving grace of one thing. If you can walk away from one thing from this seminar is when you're sizing a VFD, we use amps because uh, a VFD is producing current. It doesn't really produce horsepower. Uh, what we do is we produce a voltage uh, in the current that the motor needs to transform that voltage and current into torque and horsepower. So VFDs, we're, we shouldn't be sizing them by current. Um, you want to make sure that you maintain and, and verify the voltage and the current that your motor needs to make it run. Now, here's a, an example of uh, one of our nameplates. Uh, you can see here, uh, and I've actually got this highlighted on the left in red, is the current, the full load amps. And I want you to look at that because I told you earlier that motors are have a multi-tap capability. You can see in this case, this motor can work at 208 volts and has a hype in there working at 230, and it's got a slash to 480, which means that this uh, motor can work at 208 volts all the way to 230 and work at 460 volts. And you look at the current rating, it's 14.8 amps for 208, 14 amps for 230, and 7 amps for 480. So this really tells me a lot about it. If you call me up and send me this nameplate and say, Jeff, this is the motor we're going to run on it, the first question I'm going to ask you is, what is your voltage? And have you verified the voltage? Because a lot of times when we get to an application and they say, ah, yeah, it's 230 volt, we thought it was 460, or we thought it was 460, and it's really 230, there's not a kit we can modify uh, in the field for the VFD. You'll actually have to replace the VFD. 
Um, also, the important parts we want to get here, of course, are the, the nameplate horsepower, the nameplate current, and the nameplate RPMs, because that really tells us a lot about that motor and uh, where we really want to work uh, to make sure we're sizing that VFD correctly. Now, occasionally you'll end up with a different type of a motor. It's not necessarily a NEMA B motor. It might be a, a NEMA C or a NEMA D or a NEMA A type of a motor. And uh, the way we see that is, is we start to see different things in here. And this is a, a manufacturer who does a, a lot of submersible style pumps. You'll see these more in the residential commercial uh, irrigation channel. Uh, but they do uh, make a, a, a fairly decent motor here. You'll see this is a one horsepower motor. And you'll notice here that you have your voltage is 230, your RPM is 3450, so it's got a, it's a high RPM motor. But you'll notice here that the service factor max amps is rated at 9.8. Now, normally we would look at the amps there, and I would say the full load amps, and it doesn't even use the word full load, it just says amps there of 8.2. And typically I would see an overload of that of 10%. So I would add a, 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 an eight tenths of a horse, an amp here. So I would maybe size that at nine amps. However, I'm looking down at that service factor of 1.4, and I'm noticing this words here, three wire submersible motor. So now I'm gonna look at that and I'm gonna size probably off that service factor max amps, so that my sizing of my VFD might put me above a one horsepower, maybe into a two or three horsepower to give me uh, what I need for this unit. So the nameplate is very, very important when you're sizing these, uh, also taking into account the type of motor or the type of pump you've got uh, uh, um, that you're connecting and loading this to. Now, as I, I talked uh, a little bit ago about the different types of motors, and in the upper left-hand corner, you can see, and this is just a standard uh, Baldor, uh, it's our super E-class motor, very high efficiency. Um, uh, but it's very important to understand the type of applications and RPMs. Uh, this Archimedes screw here has a gearbox between the motor and the, and the Archimedes screw itself. So that gearbox has got minimum speeds it's got to maintain. Uh, it's got maximum speeds that it can only go to. So those are very important conditions. And when we call up and ask you, uh, you know, if you come and say, hey, we need this, here's a nameplate, we call back and ask you 20 questions. We're really trying to prevent uh, any kind of future failure you have because you've got to maintain a, a, at least about 30 hertz in that gearbox to keep the oil slinging inside of the gearbox. Very, very, very important. Um, also, totally enclosed fan-cooled motors cool better when they're moving at better, better speed because that fan on the end of the motor is moving. So typically end suction type pumps or submersible type pumps uh, have different motor classes. Um, as I talked about earlier, you might uh, uh, actually have to increase the size of uh, one frame up on a submersible motor. And when you've got a low RPM application, uh, you, you may also uh, have to uh, size up the uh, motor. But typically, if you're calling about a centrifugal pump or centrifugal blower, typically we're going to be okay. I, I do see one trend in the industry. We're seeing more and more grinder pumps, uh, chopper pumps, shredder type pumps. Um, those guys have a service factor of 2.5 or 3. And what that means is, is that when that motor or pump is in the chopping or shredding mode, it may draw two to three times nameplate current to do that chopping and shredding. So it's very, very important that when we size that VFD, we size it with enough current to handle that additional work that that motor is going to have to do. Uh, again, that's the advantage of reaching out to somebody, a Zeller or, over, or to me or one of my application engineers at the factory. Now, um, if, if you call up just about anybody and ask about uh, uh, a VFD, you'll, they're going to ask you if it's a normal overload or a high overload, or it's a constant torque or variable torque. And we use a lot of these different terms, and, and I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of an understanding of what we're really talking about here. Uh, typically for centrifugal pumps, uh, blowers and fans, and other variable torque type loads, they are typically only requiring about 110 to 120% overload current, uh, which means that when they get a high, high amount of solids come through uh, or something that's got, got more debris in it, uh, they'll see it between 110 and 120 uh, percent, and that's really about all the variable torque loads we see, and we consider that to be normal overload in the industry. Um, uh, this overload uh, will protect the motor from building up too much heat, working too hard. So you'll see it actually on the uh, uh, the thermal overloads uh, required in the VFD and also that are uh, part of normal starters. Um, when you see a positive displacement type of uh, pump or a, a belt press, uh, a PD blower, um, those kind of applications, those are more constant torque applications. They use the same amount of energy pretty much across the speed range. 
Um, and those may see 150 or 160 percent overload. You get a lot of solids building up in the bowl. If you've got a sludge pump, you want the sludge may become dry or, or have more solids in it. You've really got to push it through and you need that extra torque or current uh, inside of the VFD to run that. So that would be considered a high overload type of an application. So um, if, if they call up and say, hey, is it normal overload? You can say it's variable torque. Yes, it's normal overload. Um, or if they're talking about high overload or constant torque, uh, those words are pretty synonymous with each other. Now, mounting a VFT is always important. Uh, this, picture, this picture, of course, is tongue-in-cheek. It is, uh, uh, I think it's a Rubbermaid style of enclosure class that uh, we don't uh, certify or authorize or, or, or approve of, uh, but it, it just kind of shows you that where we install the VFDs is sometimes uh, it, it, it's funny and we see a lot of things. Um, so this is not necessarily how we want to mount one of these in an outside enclosure. Um, it's got the right VFD in it, it's just the wrong type of an enclosure. Um, so when we start talking about uh, enclosures, there's lots of numbers, there's lots of clarifications and classifications of these. Um, we have traditionally, uh, for many, many decades, used the NEMA class rating of, of enclosure classes. So the uh, NEMA type one or NEMA type 12 um, uh, and those kind of classifications. Uh, recently, UL came out with some standardization of these, and they also pushed uh, requiring more certifications and testing to substantiate uh, some of the NEMA ratings because some of the uh, the NEMA enclosure ratings were were cutting corners and and really not providing what what the what the end user really needed. Um, so we uh, they end up with a UL type rating. Uh, luckily, the, the the NEMA numbers are the same ones that UL kept using, so we didn't have a big change uh, between those two numbers. Uh, of course, you know, America has always got to be different. We always have to do things differently here in North America than the rest of the world. Uh, the rest of the world is using a, 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 an ingress protection rating or IP rating. Um, and the IP rating has got to two numbers in it. The first number represents the, the, the solids product or solids or fingers or sticks that can get into something. And the second number is moisture protection. So if you have an IP21 enclosure, that would be similar to a UL type one uh, enclosure or a NEMA one enclosure from the history. Um, the numbers within the NEMA classifications didn't always make sense because you'd think that uh, the higher the number, the more protection you got. And you do in some cases, uh, but when you're looking at indoor enclosures, a NEMA one or a NEMA two, a NEMA four or NEMA four X would be more uh, corrosion resistant, handling high pressure water. And then you'd move up to type 12, uh, which would be more dust proof, not necessarily waterproof, but it would only be dust proof. Uh, when you hit outdoor enclosures, uh, you hit the types 3 and 3R and 3X, uh, 4X, and those kind of enclosures, again, corrosion resistant to handle the hydrogen sulfide gas and ammonia and chlorine and gases and that we see in the, in the air. Um, but uh, the numbers don't always uh, make a lot of sense. So we have these charts in here. Uh, these are pretty much uh, standard charts available from uh, NEMA type of enclosures, NEMA type enclosure types. Um, and uh, there's some good uh, charts on here that really work through or kind of walk you through. But again, anytime you've got a question, anytime you're just not sure, pick up the phone, get on the phone with somebody from Zeller, uh, get a call into one of our application guys at ABB and see if we can not uh, kind of help you through that. The European ratings are, are a little more uh, substantial. Um, they are easier to understand from my point of view, having been doing this for about 30 years. Uh, but the first number is for solid products. And the, and a, a, the type one of these, anything that's 50 millimeters or larger. So it means your, your finger might uh, be able to go into it. But when you hit an IP2, uh, your finger can no longer go into there, sticks or wires and those kind of things into there. And as it gets higher and higher into there, uh, a type 12 will be similar to an IP5 and then probably a 4. So uh, your solids and protection against dust with limited ingress. And then an IP66 would be something that is basically an outdoor type of enclosure uh, designed for uh, corrosion and protection from strong uh, bursts of water and totally protected against dust. Basically, I don't want to call it impenetrable, but it'd be a very sealed type of an enclosure. The second number, of course, does follow the liquids into here. Um, and your protection is more from uh, pressure at specific angles, which we also do for NEMA 3R, uh, providing different angles of water so we don't get bounce up inside of enclosures. But we have NEMA 3R and NEMA 4 with the IP ratings, you've got two, three, four, five, and six. So uh, it's a little more cumbersome uh, uh, application, but a lot of times I've seen headphones coming in for my kids 
the rated IP67 or IP69. So uh, we are seeing that coming out in our day-to-day -day life. <coughs> so what types of enclosures are going to, or what you want to use? What, what's the best solution for you? If you call up and ask for my recommendation, and, and this is more of just a, a Jeff uh, kind of a thing, um, I'm going to recommend that you go with the type 12 enclosures. Uh, the reason is, I think for indoor use, they have a, an extra degree of protection uh, to protect you against dust and dirt and debris and solid products inside of there. They've got filters on the front of the fans that really keeps a lot of uh, garbage and debris out of the electronics, uh, off the electronic boards and those kind of things. You can see here on the right side picture, uh, that's a type 12 enclosure. You'll notice there are no vents on the front end of the, of the enclosure. And what we're doing there is we have two chambers of air. We've got that air that the electronics are in. And then we have the air in the back that has the fan moving it, where that's our heat generated components. Uh, so we keep, we do end up with a little bit of heat in the front of that, about 10 or 15 percent. But then 85 to 90 percent of that air is, is heat is actually run out through the back of the VFD. Um, we also make air here in the middle there different types of enclosures. Uh, you know, we can build it pretty much any kind of a VFD in any kind of enclosure you want. So if you tell me, Jeff, I know. I want to go uh, type one on that. That's fine. I just want to have fans in there to cool it. I may put filters in them or not. That's an example there. Uh, and then here on the left is, an, is a little smaller VFD that has a built-in disconnect uh, where you might uh, have a, it might be remote location from a motor control center feeder, a panel board or switchboard. Uh, and you have this uh, VFD mounted on the wall of the pump and there's your disconnect for the power coming into the VFD. And then you have a disconnect on the output right in front of the pump. So uh, type one uh, is more for just indoor use in a very clean and filtered room. If you've got an air conditioned room that doesn't have a lot of dust and dirt and debris inside of it, uh, type one enclosure will work just fine. But as I said, my personal preference here is type 12, where we really don't have the outside atmosphere uh, connecting with the inside of the atmosphere and, and over the electronics, uh, where in type one we would have that. Um, if you're outdoor, uh, it really depends on the kind of application. You know, I, I told you I live in Florida and, and we don't uh, get normal rain that falls down. We get it blowing in through uh, hurricanes and other kinds of forces. And so we always have to worry about horizontal rain. So uh, sometimes a type 3R panel will work just fine. Uh, and really the classification goes here from type 3R to type 4X. If you've got an application that's got a lot of hydrogen sulfide gas around it, um, in a more corrosive environment, uh, you may have it in a belt press room where you've got a lot of mud and debris and solids suspended in the air. Uh, a type 4X enclosure will, will really protect the VFD inside of it. Um, you might also have an application that that type 4 enclosure is so sealed that it holds a lot of heat inside of it. And you may need to add, as in this picture, an auxiliary air conditioner uh, that will take that additional heat that the VFD generates and cool it off into there. Uh, it, that does affect your efficiency. Uh, but it keeps a VFD running cooler, and uh, if you've got a room, uh, and we talked earlier about the heat is what uh, hurts the VFD, if you can make it cooler, that way you don't have to air condition a whole room, you can just air condition that small enclosure, uh, and give you longer life out of it. Um, the example here on the left, the picture uh, is a type 3R enclosure. Uh, we see a lot of these as painted white, so we don't have the solar heat gain that we get uh, from the sun. Uh, and as I said earlier, anytime you can mount a VFD in the shade or out of the direct sun, uh, you'll just get that benefit of additional life uh, that we have out of there. Now, how do you control your VFDs? You know, these are one of the questions we're going to ask you. We're going to say, you know, uh, do you need a pressure transmitter? Uh, do you need a flow meter? What kind of other equipment do you have in here? Oh, no, Jeff, we've got SCADA or, or uh, yeah, we don't have anything. How are we going to do that? And um, you can work with the guys there. Uh, I know Jim has done a lot of PID, set up a lot of PID loops in his lifetime. Uh, where we just take a pressure transmitter, feed it into the VFD, and the VFD maintains constant pressure. We can do the flow meters, we do level control, uh, dissolved oxygen meters, any of those kind of things. Um, so you may have an application where we have an ultrasonic level control where it's got a controller built into it, uh, or you may have a PLC in your panel, or you may be running it from SCADA. Um, and in those cases, the VFD can be as smart as you want it to be, or it can just be as simple as, uh, this is my run command, uh, this is the speed I want you to run, and then I want you to tell me if you're running and if you're powered up. and just have two output relays. Um, so it can run in that kind of a mode, or we can actually use it in the middle here. We have the VFD as, as a process controller, where it's maintaining, in this case, uh, constant DO. Um, you can give it a local remote start and stop, but then as soon as it's in the start command or running, uh, the VFD will maintain constant uh, uh, DO uh, in, a, in a basin uh, with that feedback. 
The VFD does have to have feedback to maintain the constant pressure, constant flow, or constant level. So you've got to have some sort of, of uh, analog device feeding back uh, what our set point would be to maintain uh, in, in that VFD. Uh, there, however, there will be some times that you're saying, you know, Jeff, we've got a SCADA system in here, but just in case something happens, I want my guys to have a handoff auto uh, and a speed pot here, just in case I want them to be able to, to go to a hand mode and control the speed of it automatically, starting and stopping it. Um, we can accommodate that too. So there's a lot of different ways you can control the VFD. And uh, I told you that uh, when, when you call up and, and start talking to us about applying a VFD, we're going to go through 20 questions. And these are the kind of things we're going to try to to uh, help you with to kind of circumvent in case we have any problems or in case we need to add any additional uh, peripheral uh, devices here. Uh, on this extreme one here on the right, you can see we've actually remote mounted that keypad on the front of the panel, so you do not need to open it. Um, that means you can do your programming and you can diagnostics and displays without having to have PPE on. You can keep the panel locked up and running and protect yourself from any uh, potential hazards. Now, uh, safety is, is always, always, always an important uh, issue. Uh, very few VFDs are designed for uh, explosion proof. Um, and just because you have an explosion proof motor, if you put a VFD on it, it does not always carry the same classifications. So you always want to verify uh, first of all, where the motor is going to go into, where the VFD is being mounted, and make sure that we're taking the conditions of that uh, into account because uh, the worst case, the worst situation we can have uh, is if that uh, VFD is in an unsafe uh, uh, application or in an unsafe uh, area inside of a facility. Um, I've seen many panels where uh, they've had stainless steel enclosure proof uh, or stainless steel uh, type 4X panels and they're open and they paid a guy to come in and wash the walls and he washes the VFDs down and the VFDs were hot when the water hit them. That means they have electricity connected to them. Uh, so I've seen those kind of extremes. Um, so you always want to make sure that uh, the cabinet is in, a, in the proper location, make sure it's enclosed properly. And one thing I'll uh, uh, bring up here also, um, if you think adding auxiliary fans outside of the enclosure and opening the doors up and having bigger fans blow air on the VFDs will cool them better. That's actually not the way that those VFDs are designed to cool in the enclosures. Uh, the in drives are and designed to bring cool air in through the bottom and, and exhaust it out through the top. So if, uh, when we close that door in the front of the panel, that's what the airflow get, is running into there. So you always want to make, make sure you're maintaining uh, the filters, the filter media inside of those uh, fans and make sure that the fans themselves are running. And you can just do a quick check with those. Uh, a lot of times I'll see guys carry around uh, uh, pieces of uh, tinsel from uh, Christmas time or, or pieces of plastic from uh, from uh, blowing balloons and those kind of things uh, just to see if there's airflow uh, in or out of a fan. Um, yeah, because uh, these are things you want to worry about. Uh, most of our VFDs are protected with fuses, which uh, can handle typically 100,000 uh, AIC. Uh, we do uh, ABB also manufactures a lot of circuit breakers that have 65K that uh, will quickly and safely clear a fault before it becomes catastrophic. That's the thing we're really looking for in our design here. Now, some of the pitfalls we see, um, and I talked earlier about this, is we don't really want to mount a VFD in an explosion-proof area. You know, you've got a lot of capabilities to mount the VFD, you know, up to a thousand feet away from the motor. Uh, take advantage of that and put it into an area that's a little more safe, a little more conducive, and and actually that might benefit the life of the VFD if you can get it out of the direct sun and in some sort of enclosure uh, that's got good airflow inside of it. Uh, a lot of times you get better life out of the VFD uh, and it will make it easier to to keep that unit up. You know, one of the challenges we have is a lot of times we're required to put the VFD where it has to be. Um, and sometimes that's not in the best condition and it really affects the, the longevity or lifetime of our equipment. Um, fog, uh, and this is not fats, oils, and grease. This is more fog. This is more humidity or moisture or, or actually a true fog. Uh, where we have condensating water. Um, most VFD, very, VFDs work very, very well in high humidity environments until we start getting into condensation. As soon as we get droplets of water on the printed circuit boards, onto the electronic components, uh, we start having the potential for uh, arcing. Uh, as soon as that arcing comes up inside of there, uh, we have the potential to have a, a failure inside of the VFD and it could be a catastrophic failure and damage the equipment beyond repair. So. Um, anytime we can get these into more drier areas, keeping them out of uh, high moisture areas, and that can be in a type 4X enclosure, can be with an air conditioner, uh, can be with a space heater inside of the panel, just to really trying to keep uh, the humidity down uh, in those. Um, and as I said earlier, typically we're working with temperatures that work up to about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. 
if you've got uh, an application that's going to be that's going to see higher temperatures than that, um, we can do some derating on the VFDs. Typically, we uh, derate about 10% uh, derate for every uh, degree C. So, so quickly in, in summary here, um, I, I, I hope that uh, I've been able to give you some very good basics on how do you select and how you size VFDs. Um, uh, picking the right enclosure, how important the motor nameplate is, and, and how much it, how much easier it makes us to help you with the sizing of those applications, and really understanding that uh, the drive is not developing current is developing current, it's not really developing horsepower. So I don't I'm not as interested as much in the horsepower rating of your motor as I am the nameplate current and the nameplate RPMs. Um, talked a little bit about enclosure ratings and where to use them and where not to use them. And of course, uh, I really want to drive home the safety message here. You know, uh, uh, AV is a very strong and safe company, as is Zeller, and their uh, all their guys are carry around their PPE and have all of their uh, safety certifications. So uh, well, the best thing in the world is that we can all go home every night uh, and see our loved ones, uh, even if we have to social distance from them. We can at least uh, get a chance to see them. So uh, just a quick checklist. We do uh, have uh, a, a really interesting guide here that we make available for uh, designers, engineers, con contractors, consulting engineers, and those kind of things. That's called the Consultant's Guide or Industry Checklist for Variable Frequency Drives. Uh, and it kind of goes through a, a, a pretty extensive checklist, kind of making sure you've taken everything into account. So uh, if you're a first time user and you're interested in this, you can give uh, uh, Jim or, or, or Brian a call at Zeller and they'll uh, make this available to you. It's in a PDF format. Uh, and it's just got a bunch of check boxes in here that just kind of walk you through things that you want to take into account. How are you controlling it? Uh, will you be using the PID controller? What kind of uh, signal do you have on the PID controller? What, is it a 4 to 20 million signal or 0 to 10 volt level control, flow control? Um, do the circuit boards uh, need to be conformal coded to withstand higher concentrations of gas? Uh, do you need the pump features? Which pump features do you need in there? Do you need the pump clean feature? Do you need the motor preheat and those kind of things? And that those things will just really uh, help us uh, make sure we don't get that oops or gotcha into there. Uh, and I'll tell you one of the great things that we have here at ABD is we have a 36 month standard uh, warranty. When any of the guys from uh, uh, Zeller come out and do your startup, uh, you get the additional year of warranty. Normally we do two years, but anytime you have one of our service centers or one of our partners uh, do the uh, startup, uh, they give you a 36 month warranty from the date of shipment of the product. So you get a nice three year warranty out of that. that and it's a it's a very, very good warranty. And, and what we're looking for here is, of course, to put you a peace of mind, uh, give you the confidence that the VFD can run, and also give you the confidence that it's going to run for the time that uh, that you need it to run. Um, Brian, I'm going to open it up for questions to see if we've got any questions. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. That's a great summary, a, a lot of great information in there. Um, I know Somebody asked if they could have a copy of this uh, presentation or some of the tables that you had in there. I do know that we're going to be forwarding on. Um, anybody that registered, whether you're here or not, gets a copy of this webinar. Uh, but I'm sure, Jeff, we can get into your guys' uh, library of, of tables and charts and things and make some of that stuff shareable. Absolutely, we can. Uh, and also, uh, if, if, if I have any engineers or operator groups or, or people interested, uh, myself or Jim or Brian can come out and do this presentation one on one and really tailor it to your group organization. Uh, reach out to us. Uh, I'm available at jeff.bergman at us.add.com. Uh, or reach out again through Brian or Jim, and, and we'll be more than happy to accommodate you. Uh, and Brian, as soon as I'm done with the presentation, I'll pop it off in an email to you so you can share it with everybody. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, I don't, it wasn't a question that came in, but it was something that came to mind. You just kind of covered warranty and and uh, our certified startup of these drives. You want to hit just briefly before we, we sign off here on um, some of the extended drive care, yeah. just generally what, what we offer here, because I, I think it's a differentiator, uh, not just with ABB, but with with, with drives. You, right. don't, you just don't buy a lot of equipment these days that have these extended warranties, or it's really not extended warranty, but just preventative care packages later in life and uh if you could speak to that a little bit jeff i think some of the audience here seeing some uh, some maintenance and mro type of folk on online would like to see that uh kind of end of life yeah for all you know brian, you're exactly right brian i mean in, in in our world of the municipal business where we've got a, an aging infrastructure and we're looking at prolonging that the lifetime of our pipes and of our motors and our pumps as long as we can uh, the VFDs fall into that and and doing preventative maintenance on the VFDs whether that's on an annual basis or every two-year basis really 
helps improve the life of the VFD. You know, some of the biggest failure modes we see for VFDs are loose wires uh, or heat because of the filters or the fans have failed inside of the VFD and it just gets too hot. And those are things that can be found through just a normal routine preventative maintenance check. Uh, you do the jerk test on the wires, you come in and make sure that the fans are blowing, check the current on there. If it's if it's popping fuses on the fan, there's something wrong on that. And, and just doing that preventative maintenance, and, and we do offer some extended warranties like you were talking about with complete care uh, that we can guarantee a VFD for six years or as much as 10 years. And that 10 year warranty comes with a couple of preventative maintenance of visits in the middle of that. And that's where one of the one of your technicians from uh, Zeller would come out and do a PM, we'd vacuum the VFD out. You never, ever, ever, guys, ever want to use compressed air to blow out a VFD. You can use it on the heat sink on the outside of it, but you never want to do that on the inside because what happens is you're blowing dirt and dust, you're forcing into areas that it's not designed to be. You always want to suck the air out, uh, use a vacuum cleaner to vacuum and suck out all the dirt and debris that's building up inside of the enclosure, uh, do all those tests, go through the static tests of the IGBTs, the capacitors, uh, the SCRs, or, or a diode bridge rectifier, making sure it's still in tolerances and specs, and getting one of the guys from Zeller to come in and do that and offer that as a plan. Zeller can offer preventative maintenance plans by themselves. They can offer extended warranty programs by themselves, or they can offer a combination of those. Uh, and, and Brian, you know as well as I do, the more we maintain the equipment, the longer it lasts, and, and that's the value we can offer to our customers. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. If sure. there's, uh, if you, if you guys have other questions out there, uh, please use the chat or question function in the in your uh, your option window. I don't see anything else logged in there right now, so I'll give it a couple seconds here. But if there's nothing else added, um, I think you did a super thorough job today um, on understanding why we need to size uh, these drives properly and some considerations when planning on uh, putting in new drives or replacing drives making sure that we do have uh, the right sizing um, and considerations taken so that we don't have any of those gotchas and what ifs down the road. So really appreciate your time here today, Jeff, and uh, super excited to continue this on again, a monthly reoccurring uh, set of sessions for water drive and water applications. Um, it's usually about the first week of the month and uh, we've got one again scheduled here in November, another in December, and, and a what will be the fifth one in our web webinar series so far scheduled for January. So we'll make sure that everybody that uh, got notice about today's re registration also sees um, the invitation for, for next month's as well. Um, Jeff will be leading that as well. And as we take a little um, look forward into, into more application-based situations. So thank you, Jeff. I don't see any other questions. So I think we're going to sign off today. Um, if you need anything else from our team here at Zeller or from our experts at ABB, please get it, get in touch with your, uh, your Zeller account manager and take care of you. Well, there you go. So number three. Yep. Yep. So this is, uh, we'll be going, we'll be doing, we've done the first two. How do you control the speed and thinking of sizing? The next one is, uh, achieving system performance using VFDs. Uh, then we'll be looking at electrical installation. We'll be looking at IEEE 519 for harmonics. Uh, and then we've got one that we that's a brand new one here, Brian, called emergency generators and VFTs. Sometimes they mix, sometimes they don't. So what are the problems and issues with that? So that's a, a new one, and we're adding these uh, almost every month or two. We're adding another one of these sessions to it. So we can continue this session on. We can go on to eternity just to helping share this kind of information. Well, it's all great stuff. I'm sure we'll uh, we'll continue adding past January. But uh, thanks again, Jeff, for your involvement today. Super excited to have uh, ABB as a great partner here. Um, we'll sign off for today. We'll hopefully see everybody at uh, webinar series number three. See, hopefully see everybody at WebTech. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everybody. See you.